two, one. Part two of limits. All right, let's get going. All right, so um, as promised in the previous video, uh, the goal for this one is to talk about the other types of limits that we encounter in calculus. So last time we established the formal definition of the limit of a function, but from calculus, you know, we know there are some other things you can do with limits, such as taking limits from the left or the right, limits uh, going to infinity, and uh, taking the limit to infinity. So that will be what we'll talk about. And uh, I'm not going to lie, uh, a lot of what we're going to see uh, today is a little bit on the drier side of things. Um, as we noted with limits, I mean, for the most part, it was really kind of just setting up the definitions to match our intuition and kind of working out the details. That's essentially what we're going to do three times today, um, getting the left and right uh, cited limits set up um, and then getting the limits um, as x approaches infinity set up and then talking about limits that go to infinity. All right, well, so to set up limits coming from the left or the right, uh, let's take a moment and prove a fact about cluster points. This could be quite useful to us. Um, let's say I have two subsets of the real line. A is a subset of B, which is a subset of the real line, and I've got a cluster point for the smaller set, then A is a cluster point for the larger one, and this is hopefully very easy to immediately see why this would be true, given a delta, there is an x, so that everything works. Well, x is an a, so it's got to be in b, and there you go, it's got a point for b. Uh, it's simple as, you know, it's, it's not that hard. Now, for us, why is this going to be a particularly profound result? Well, note that it immediately implies the following. If we've got a cluster point for a set consisting of elements that are only to the right of A, that's a cluster point of the original. So like, ooh, maybe if I've got a right-handed limit, ooh, a limit coming in from the right. And likewise, if A is a cluster point of S intersected with all the elements to the left of A, so in other words, all the elements of S that are to the left of A, then that's a cluster point for S. So let's say I was, oh, I don't know, taking a limit from the right and taking a limit from the right, left, then taking a full limit is a valid thing. Ah, beautiful. All right, so uh, before we do get to the formal definition of a limit from a left and a limit from a right, uh, let's um, first focus a little bit more on the uh, notion of being a cluster point for the sets that we just discussed. Okay. So specifically, A is a cluster point for this set. If given a delta, there is an element in X, so that X is within delta of A, but it's a little bit stronger. It's within delta of A, and we are bigger than A. All right. So uh, this will help us get a precise definition of a limit from the right, and likewise, this will give us a precise definition of limit from the left. All right, so we're going to prove one, and then note that two works the same way. That's going to be kind of a theme here for a couple of the proofs that we're about to do, where it's a lot of, like, we'll do it from the right, and then for the left, just swap all the inequalities. All right, so let's suppose A is a cluster point of the set. Given a delta, that means uh, <laughs> this set's not empty. And uh, it, it's not that bad of a set, but, right, it's, yeah, you know. And so, like I said, the set definition for cluster point, we'll go back to it every so often because every so often it's the better one to use. And in this case, it's the better one to use here. Um, because since that is not empty, that means I can find an element X that lives in this interval and lives in S intersected this interval. Uh, this implies that that has to hold. And since we're in here, we're in S and we are bigger than A. So there we go. That's all I wanted to show. That X was in S and that A is less than X and X is strictly less than A plus delta. Straightforward, nice and easy. So here we see uh, using the set definition of cluster point, picked up everything I wanted. Now it is worth knowing right that there's a lot more extra junk floating around here. And I kind of only isolated the things I wanted. Like I never really used this. And I never used this part of the interval, but it works. Now, going backwards, we'll see that this gets you everything, but to get here, we only needed part of it. This is quite interesting. All right. 
Let's do the reverse. Pros out for each delta. I can find an element uh, x that lives in s, so that that holds. Okay, so that's what we're assuming. So now let's assume we've got a positive delta. I want to show x is a limit point, um, a cluster point. So I got to use one of the many uh, equivalent definitions of it. But our assumption gives us an x so that that inequality holds. Okay. So note that that would mean that x is bigger than a, and so x lives in this set because it's in s and that one. Furthermore, x is not equal to a by this. So that means that x actually lives in that set. And then finally, since this must hold because delta is positive, that's why this part of the inequality is true. That means that x will live in this interval, so that means this set is not empty, and thus we are a cluster point of that set. There we go. Beautiful. Alright, like I said in part two, same thing as part one, just only now we'll focus on, instead of the a plus delta, you'll look at the a minus delta. Yeah, that's it. Not too much else there. Alright, beautiful. Uh, it's a beaut. Oh. All right, so uh, with the notion of cluster point of those sets thoroughly investigated and some nice equivalent conditions, we're almost on our way. We got one more thing to do, um, and I went back and looked because I could have sworn I talked about this, but apparently I didn't. Um, so one quick little set theoretic uh, diversion. Um, so given a function from A to B and a subset of A, then we can form the restriction of F to C by simply taking the function f to be the function that is defined the exact same way, but the inputs are limited to c. That's it. Nothing else with that. Um, yeah, and um, just to get a quick uh, feel for how this stuff works, let's prove uh, a property involving it. So if we've got a function and a c and a set, if we want to look at the inverse image, um, then it's the same thing as the inverse image of the original function intersected with C. A nice uh, uh, result. And give us a little feel for how to work for this. And like I said, I could have sworn I had this in there, but I went back and looked and it wasn't there. And I was like, what? And then I looked at Level's book. Level doesn't bring this up until now. And I was like, that's weird. I forgot to. I mean, both of us forgot to do that back there. But anyway. Or, oh, wait, no, maybe he actually has it there and I skipped over for some reason. I don't know. Anyway, so let's get a proof. Uh, so we got a feel for those things. We are going to use this uh, to create the left and right limits. All right, so pick an element of the set on the left. That means that f uh, restricted to c, evaluated at x, lives in d. But that means f of x lives in d. So that means f is in the inverse image of d. And by construction, if we're in the set, we have to be in c. So we're in the intersection. There we go. Right now, conversely, if we're in that intersection, well, then uh, we're in this set and we're in this set. F of X lands in D and F restricted to C evaluated at X. All right. Uh, which I'm allowed to do because X lives in C is just F. And so there we go. <laughs> if uh, X must be in the inverse image of D under the function F restricted to C. And there we go. Beautiful. All right, so we got a good feeling uh, for how the restriction of a function works. So we've got cluster points defined for left and right. Let's go. So, given a set and a function f, if we've got a cluster point for the set s intersect uh, a to infinity, so like I have been saying, call it's basically a cluster point of s to the right, uh, then we say that f of x has a limit as x goes to a from the right if the limit of this function exists. There we go. So, and when it does, we denote it um, as you've seen before, x approaching a, right? So we're talking about the things in s um, and uh, points on the right of a uh, that s uh, approximates a but with. And there we go. Okay, so, uh, kind of the reason to do it this way is that we know limits of functions are unique things. So that's kind of why I went this way with um, defining it to be the limit of this restriction. I know this looks a little messy, but we are about to get a more um, 
straightforward version of it, but we want to use it this way because limit of this function, that's a unique concept. So, there we go. Right, if we define that another way, we have to verify that those types of limits are unique. We already have the uniqueness built into this, so let's just use it. All right, and likewise, uh, limits for the left are defined similarly. Uh, limits from the left are going to be kind of like the whip and post, I guess, for those. Just like, yeah, and then you can do it for the left, too, if you care. Um, <laughs> all right, there we go. All right, beautiful. All right, so um, that's how we will formally define limits from the right, limits from the left. They are the limit of a restriction of a function. But there is a more precise manner of dealing with them. All right, so specifically, take a subset of R, a function uh, from S to R, and an L out of the real numbers. Let A be a cluster point of S intersect A to the interval A to infinity. Then L is the limit of the function as we approach A from the right. If and only if given an epsilon, there is a delta so that the output of the function does what we want. And the inputs are coming in only from the right. And likewise, same thing for coming in for the left. X is coming in to the left of A. All right. So there we go, <laughs> a direct uh, definition for these things that allows us to sort of circumvent dealing with the restrictions. Like I said, we use restrictions because we know the limits of those functions are unique, so we have a unique quantity to work with, and now we see that that unique quantity can be represented as we've seen before. So left and right sided limits are going to behave the way that you want them to. So let's go ahead and prove that, and again, we'll prove one, and then note that you do the same thing for two. All right, so suppose L is the limit as we come in from the right. That means that L is the limit of F restricted to that set. Let epsilon be bigger than zero. That means there is a delta, so that all this stuff works out the way we want it to. All right, now take any X satisfying this. Note that this has to hold. All right, just subtract A from both sides. X minus A is strictly positive, so it's equal to its absolute value, and it's less than delta. And since X lives in this set, that means we can feed it into the restriction, and the output of the restriction is the original output. And there you go. That's less than epsilon. As claimed, given an epsilon, there is a delta, so that for any points coming in from the right within delta of A, the output gets within epsilon of L. Beautiful. All right. There we go. So now, let's go the other way. Suppose I give it an epsilon, there's a delta, so that any point coming in from the right of A, that it's within delta, the outputs behave, then we'll verify that the limit of the restriction is what it should be. All right, give it an epsilon. Suppose that, this, suppose that we know this is true, so let epsilon be given. By assumption, I get the delta, so that I'm happy. All right, now take an element that lives in that set that is within... Um, delta of it, under the usual uh, parameters of it. <coughs> Alright, now since x lives in this set, it must be to the right. Okay, so that means uh, that x minus a is positive. Um, and thus, uh, it's equal to its absolute value. Actually, it's not a less than or equal to. We, uh, we know that that would be equal. Right, so subtract it over x minus a is positive, so just plugging that in right there. Yeah, let me rephrase that. I don't like the way that's phrased. And, uh, oh god. What's happening? Oh no, it's having a heart attack. Uh oh. Up oh, there you are. Also gives. Okay. Alright, so we have assumed this. Alright. Now, what we're going to show is that any x in this set satisfying this will satisfy this, which means that this would have to be less than epsilon. So we've already done that. So this is less than epsilon, but x lives in the set, so it's the same thing as the restriction uh, evaluated at x. 
And there we go. L must be the limit of this function. So L is the limit of f of x as x goes to the right. As x goes approaches a from the right. <coughs> and there we go. All right. So we've established what it means for a limit to approach from the left and to approach from the right. And we now have a explicit epsilon delta definition to work with it. So now let's prove the classic result from calculus that we all know. If the limit on the left exists and the limit on the right exists and those two quantities are equal, then the limit overall exists. Okay. So let us be a subset of the real line. Take any cluster point for both of these sets. Now, as we already proved, that means you must be a cluster point for S itself. Uh, fun fact, you could be a cluster point for S, but fail to be a cluster point of one of these. Uh, because one of these might be empty. And the empty set has no cluster points. Alright. Cool. Alright. So there we go. If the left and right hand limits exist and are equal to each other, then the overall limit must exist. And that's an if and only if. So let's do it. All right, and for this one, we're going to use the uh, definition, of course, that we just established. It's a lot easier to work with, but we are going to have to break things into cases. So let's see that in action. So suppose that L is indeed the limit. I want to prove that it's both the left and right sided limits as well. All right, we'll let epsilon be greater than zero. Then there is a delta so that uh, the output gets within epsilon for any x's whose inputs are within delta of A, not equal to A. All right, so given any x that is to the right of a, but within delta, then this holds, because it does, subtract it over, it works. So f of x is within epsilon of l, and likewise, if we are within uh, delta of a to the left, the same thing is true. So l must be the limit from uh, for our function approaching from the right and approaching from the left. The end. <coughs> right, not not too difficult, right? We had this, so that tells us that if you have this, then you get this, right? This implies that. Right, this implies that. Cool. Right, the trickier thing, though, is going to be that um, this on its own does not necessarily imply this or that. So things are going to have to split into two possibilities. So the converse of this is actually going to be the trickier thing to prove. Right, and in some sense is the more useful one, right? If I know you get the limit from the right and the left, then I've got the full limit. Right. Very rarely do we use the fact that, oh, I've got the limit, so that means I've got the left and the right sided limit. So this is really the money thing, and as we'll see, the proof has a bit more activity to it because of that. Okay. All right, so epsilon being bigger than zero, I need to create a delta so that anything that gets within delta of A, regardless if it's coming in from the left or the right, is going to behave. Uh, but my hypothesis, uh, hypothesis here only gives me two things, gives me two things to work with. It gives me a delta and it gives me an eta. So as we did, we will let nu be the minimum of the two. And now we'll take an element uh, that lives within uh, <coughs> nu of a, but not equal to a. And now we need to show that f of x minus l gets less than epsilon. And as x is not equal to a, that means we've got two possibilities. Okay. All right, so by trichotomy, we know that a is either bigger than a or less than a. Well, if it's bigger than a, okay, then that holds which ensures that that holds, and thus um, our x satisfies this, which means my f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Like, beautiful. All right, and uh, similarly, I should have had a pause, but whatever. If x is less than a, then negative eta is less than or equal to negative nu, which is less than x minus a. Okay. And again, that is coming from uh, here. Um, right, because this holds, we know that x minus a is uh, greater than uh, negative nu. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, negative nu. All right, and then um, 
add the a over, so that means x is uh, less than a, and x is also bigger than a minus nu, so this is satisfied, thus we can conclude this. All right, so it doesn't matter where x is, if it lands to the right of a or to the left of a, the output's got to be with an epsilon, and it is exactly what we wanted. Given an epsilon, there is a delta that works. Beautiful. All right. So, no, not too super tricky, just our usual, we picked up two uh, positive constants, so uh, we take uh, the minimum in this case. So something that we've already seen in action quite a bit. And here we see it paying off and getting us what we wanted in the very classic result in calculus. Alright, beautiful. Alright, so with that established, what next? Alright. Alright, so as I promised, um, there are, of course, some other types of limits that we encounter in calculus, which are the infinite limits, and so now we're going to be in the process of actually working with that. Now, to take the limit as x goes to infinity, or the limit as x goes to minus infinity, well, we need to have a concept of infinity and minus infinity being cluster points. Alright, and so infinity will be considered a cluster point for a set S if for any positive M there is an element in the set S uh, that gets bigger than M. And likewise, uh, negative infinity is a cluster point if given any positive number, there is an X that gets smaller than negative M. Okay. So note the same kind of format, given a positive quantity, there's something that I want. Uh, but it turns out that infinity and minus infinity being a cluster point is literally just asking um, these to be sets that are not bounded above or bounded below. Nice. Now, um, you could just take this to be the definition for infinity being a cluster point, uh, but in practice, this variant of it is um, a little bit better, especially for limits, because again, we want the kind of like given a positive quantity, things work the way we want to. Um, but let's show um, how this works. So again, as usual, we'll prove one and then leave two to the interested uh, student. Suppose infinity is a cluster point. Now, if S was bounded above, that means there has to be a beta, so that X is less than or equal to beta for all X. Now note, that's the definition, and there was nothing about that definition forcing beta to be a strictly positive quantity. So, we'll fly in with the Archimedean property, we get a positive number strictly less than b, but our hypothesis that infinity is a cluster point gives us an x that's bigger than n. But then we get our favorite contradictory, x is strictly less than x. Alright. And there you go. Actually, now that I think about it, I think I actually do proof too. Do I? Yeah, I actually do. Oh my god, what? I totally forgot. Yeah, we're actually doing the proof of two. Um, uh, I lied to you. It's it, it's it's worth doing because there's like this minus sign that shows up. Um, anyway, all right. So suppose S is not bounded above for any positive quantity, M can't be an upper bound, so there's something bigger than M. The end. Yes, the converse is super easy. <coughs> all right, so it's actually proof two. So suppose that negative infinity is a cluster point. If we were bounded below, there is a beta bigger than it. The Archimedean property guarantees an n strictly bigger than negative beta, which would mean that negative n is strictly less than beta. And since n is strictly positive, our assumption that negative infinity is a cluster point gives us an x strictly less than it, but then we get our same favorite contradiction, x is strictly less than itself. And there you go, yes, is not bounded above, and proving that not bounded above guarantees negative infinity as a cluster point, is proven in a similar manner. Actually, I feel like the main reason I proved two is because um, uh, the way this slide worked out, I didn't have enough room for the rest of the proof. And uh, I've been neglecting all of the point twos throughout the, uh, <laughs> the uh, slides here, so maybe I felt I should give one a little bit justice. And this one does require a little, just like a little side move, so it's a little bit more involved, but... There you go, we have a definition for infinity being a cluster point. Now, before we get to defining the limit as a function goes to infinity, let's go back to our friend's sequences. 
So we'll say a sequence of real numbers converges to infinity if given an m, there is a point n, so that our sequence gets bigger than that m and stays bigger. Okay, so note, for a sequence to be converging, it's not enough to just be like, well, the sequence is not bounded above. Or right, the sequence can be not bounded above, but that does not mean the outputs get close to infinity and stay close. Right, we can be alternating between positive and negative numbers. Right, you can have a sequence that's 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5. That sequence is unbounded, but the sequence doesn't stay close to infinity. It's constantly oscillating. Os uh, okay. Okay. And if this happens, we write this. And likewise, same thing for minus infinity. Um, and note the way we're formatting it. Because what we will now prove is that being a cluster point, is precisely when you can create a sequence so that we go off to infinity. Now note here, we actually don't need to include the x, uh, the set um, minus, the set difference that we had to before because infinity is not a real number. Likewise, negative infinity is not a real number. Beautiful. All right. All right, so I'll prove that infinity is a cluster point precisely if we can create a sequence that converges to infinity. <coughs> And likewise, uh, for point two, and at this point two, I think I legit do not prove. I'm going to eat those words. Watch. All right. So suppose infinity is a cluster point for us. Okay. That means for every natural number, uh, I can find a x sub n that gets bigger than n. That actually needs to be a cluster point. Okay. Now, given any positive n, there is a capital uh, n out of the natural, so m is strictly less than it. So for any n bigger than that, x of n is strictly bigger than m, and thus, there we go, given a um, positive m, there is a uh, sequence, uh, there is um, a sequence, so that at some point, the sequence gets bigger than m and stays bigger than m. So we constructed our sequence, and then we verified that for any m, our sequence has the property that we can always find a capital N, so that... At the, after that point in the sequence, we stay strictly bigger than m. All right, and conversely, suppose we have a sequence that converges to infinity for any positive m. That means there is some point in the sequence where we get bigger than it, but that means a particular x of capital N is bigger than m, guaranteeing that infinity is a cluster point. And so a similar law. There we go. Nice. All right, yeah, not too bad, not too shabby. All right, now with all of that equipped, we can finally define the limit of a function going to infinity. So given a subset of the real line and a function, we say that L is A, now note the definition, A limit as X approaches infinity, if infinity is a cluster point, and given an epsilon, there is a positive M, so that the output of our function gets within epsilon of L, and that's good for all X in S that are strictly bigger than M. Similar story for limits approaching minus infinity. All right, and note, as we had to do with limits, we gotta verify uniqueness, right? Because again, the L here could be any real number, and, right, nothing about this definition is immediately saying L needs to be unique. And as we'll see, the hypothesis of infinity being a cluster point is key. So this proof is one that we've essentially already done, but there's just different machinery around it. And this happens sometimes, uh, where you'll get, like, two theorems and, like, you have, like, essentially identical proofs. And there may be that part of your brain that kicks in and you're like, ooh, maybe there's, like, a general theorem or something. And sometimes there is, and there is for this, but it's not worth it. Trust me, I've been there. All right, so anyway, um, by hypothesis, uh, L and T are limits of F as we go to infinity. Okay, so there's an A, so that for anything bigger than A, we go with an epsilon over 2. Anything bigger than B, we go with an epsilon over 2. Set M to be the maximum of those two things. Now, no, we're doing maximums for this one. All right, infinity is a cluster point, so there is some point that gets bigger than M. All right, since X is bigger than M, it's bigger than A, which means this holds. It's bigger than M, so it's bigger than B, so this holds. And there we go. L minus T's absolute value is always strictly less than epsilon, so L must equal T. 
And then you can do a similar thing for uh, infinite limits, uh, go, uh, um, the limit going to negative infinity. All right. So, uh, if our function has a limit as x goes to infinity, we've just verified that it must indeed be unique. And, of course, we define it as follows. Similarly, we can define this. And um, what we will prove is um, a sequence version like we did before. And now since we have a sequence version, that means uh, various properties of sequences that we proved can be applied to functions. So summations, inequalities, squeeze theorems, whatever you want. <coughs> All right, so take a fun take a uh, set that has infinity as a cluster point and a function, and a L, and L is the limit as x goes to infinity. Precisely, if given any sequence going off to infinity, the limit of the outputs are is equal to L. Now, the same thing will hold for this. I'm not going to state and prove it, uh, but you can do it if you are so inclined. And so this proof is going to work very similar to. Uh, the same version of this that we saw last time. So, <clears throat> suppose that the uh, limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is L, take a sequence converging to infinity, let epsilon be greater than zero. So by assumption, uh, because the limit's equal to L, there is an M so that this works. All right, now since x uh, sub n converges to infinity, at some point the sequence gets bigger than m, <laughs> it stays bigger than m. All right, since all of the inputs are bigger than m, that means their outputs must be with an epsilon, so the sequence converges to L, as promised. All right, and for the converse, we'll do what we did last time. Suppose the limit uh, as x goes to infinity of f of x is not equal to L, that means there is a bad epsilon, so that for any positive m, there is a bad input. So there is a bad epsilon, causing that to happen with a bad input x. That's good for all positive m. So for each n, just find x sub n so that n is strictly bigger than x sub n. Note that the sequence as constructed must converge to infinity. All right, we've already seen this in action. This is a any sequence with this property must converge to infinity. All right, but the output sequence cannot possibly converge, and so the proof is done. Beautiful, and now equip of this, uh, very similar to as we did last time when it came to uh, limits, any fact for limits of sequences can now be applied to limits of functions going to infinity. So all sorts of summations, uh, products, inequality, squeeze theorem, you can apply them to these limits. All right, and we got one last type of limit to discuss. All right, so given a subset of the real line with a cluster point, um, C, do I keep it consistent with C? I just changed it to C for like no reason. That's fine, all right. C for cluster point, I guess. I've been using A. Because I, I, I like f of x. I, I like x minus a better than I like x minus c. Our book uses c. Um, but yes, I guess that's what happened here. Anyway, okay. So x, f of x goes to infinity as x goes to c. If given an m, strictly positive, there is a delta so that the output gets bigger than m. And that's good for all inputs that are from delta. So not too shocking, right? A similar sort of thing that we've been seeing. Okay. And when this happens, we can write the limit like this. So no, the thing is going to a specific thing, so I don't need to prove like a uniqueness or anything like that, right? Uh, infinity is a specific quantity that we're going to, so there's no need for us to establish uniqueness here, because it's built, it is built into the definition this time. And likewise for negative infinity, we got that, and to uh, play us off today, let's actually prove uh, something, the limit as x goes to zero of one over x squared is indeed equal to infinity. All right. So what do we need to prove here? So let's uh, plan the work for your working plan. Uh, given any positive m, I need to find you a delta 
so that uh, 1 over x squared gets bigger than m, and that's good for all x um, close to 0. All right. So let m be positive. We can find an n strictly bigger than it by the Archimedean property. Now we'll set delta equal to square root of 1 over that. Note that delta is positive. And just as we did last time with an explicit limit, the deltas you get sometimes are a little, you know, just like, sure, I bet that works. And indeed it's going to. Uh, because if I give you any x uh, that lives in s, um, and now note, as we did last time, when I write this, what I really mean is I have the function defined on a set s um, that has 0 as a cluster point. So for any x uh, satisfying this, all right, well, the absolute value of uh, x, remember, is the square root of x squared. So this is true. So now when I square both sides, I'll pick up x squared, and I'll pick up 1 over n. All right, x, note, is not equal to 0, so I can multiply it over. And that means 1 over x squared is bigger than n, but n was chosen to be bigger than m, and the proof is over. Beautiful. Because for every positive m, I can find you a delta, so that for all inputs within that delta, the output gets bigger than 1 over m. There we go. The limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x squared is indeed positive infinity. There we go. Beautiful. So in some sense, um, showing things go to positive infinity or showing they go to negative infinity is actually a little bit easier in terms of like what you end up having to do. Um, right, you, you basically just need to show that it gets arbitrarily big and stays arbitrarily big. And a little bit easier than having to show like an absolute value is behaving um, in a certain way. But there we go. So I got to the limit. All right. Well, now that we have all this beautiful limit tree set up, It's time to talk about my absolute favorite thing, so we'll see that in the next video.